Um, all right, I'm going to start recording now. Um, so just as a quick note to everybody, this uh, talk is going to be recorded and I'm, I'm going to be publishing it online um, a bit later. Um, so uh, just to do a quick introduction to introduce Janice and, and the talk and everything. So, um, uh, but first, my name is Dustin O'Hara. I'm the director of the Internet Studies Center here at Western Washington University. And the Internet Studies Center um, aims to foster the interdisciplinary approach to uh, the, the study and design of digital technologies. And the lecture series is bringing together uh, or is presenting, you know, leading scholars and practitioners whose work challenges and extends our understanding of digital technology and, and its place in the world. Uh, Janice Gates is director of the Equitable Internet Initiative, where she works with community organizations to develop uh, strategies for sustainability, business planning, strategic partnerships, and workforce development uh, through the Digital Stewards Training Program. Uh, Gates is committed to collaborative problem solving, storytelling, education, organizing, community ownership, authentic relationships, digital security, privacy, consent, and the Detroit digital justice principles that focus on access, healthy communities, participation, and common ownership. She has presented the Equitable Internet Initiative at the Brooklyn Public Library, Columbia University, the Internet Freedom Festival, University of Michigan, Allied Media Conference, and Stanford University, and the uh, Republica Conference. Um, so, so with that, I'm 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 really pleased to um, you know uh, introduce all of you to to um, to Janice. This is a really exciting project. I've been following the Equ Equitable Internet Initiative and the Detroit um, uh, Community Technology Project uh, for for quite some time. So. I'm, I'm excited to have you and uh, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Dustin. Um, thank you, all of you who are on the call. Um, yeah, I just appreciate, you know, the opportunity to be here and talk to you all today um, about the Equitable Internet Initiative. Um, <clears throat> yeah, which we call EI for short. Um, it is a program of the Detroit Community Technology Project. Um, but before I kind of jump into just kind of giving you all an overview of kind of the beginnings of EII and where EII is right now, um, I wanted to share a video with you. Um, and this video really highlights um, some of the work that our digital stewards, um, and I'll also share more about them later, but they actually build out and maintain the network infrastructure. Um, so this video, um, just kind of gets at what they did last year. Um, oh, one sec. oh, there it is, I lost my screen. Okay, so I'm gonna, if you just put it in the chat, if you can't hear the video once I start playing it, um, just pull it up. Even before the pandemic, uh, digital access was a huge challenge in the city of Detroit. In southwest Detroit, and you know, some people might not have internet. On a 95 degree day, this team from the Equitable Internet Initiative, or EII, is installing internet infrastructure. A hotspot install at the Michigan Welcome Center in southwest Detroit. Public internet access for everyone in the surrounding community. When the pandemic first happened and there was no access to the internet, like their access to online learning didn't exist. We can't just assume that people have access to the internet or that they have the resources to be able to, you know, pay the monthly subscription to buy it from Comcast or wherever. Raquel Castaneda Lopez is a city council member in Detroit. It's about 38% of folks that don't have any internet access at all in the city of Detroit. A study by Pew Research shows 15% of school-age kids don't have a high-speed connection at home. 
Because of COVID-19, many kids have been forced to work online, and that could continue for part of the next school year. The coronavirus, not everybody's, most everybody's working from home. School work is doing the home. You my grandbaby, you got the internet. Before October of last year, Norma Heath didn't have reliable internet. Now, a futuristic teepee sits beside her house. When people pass by, they like, you know, what's that? You know, it's good to see something different. The solar internet TP was installed by the Equitable Internet Initiative and its partners. It's a nominal fee you know, that you can afford. It now serves nearby neighbors. My fifth year or more, kids over there come over here and sit down and they um, do their little homework. Whether it's too expensive or just not available, the EII has been working on filling the gaps in internet access for years. We prioritize homes who have no access to the internet at all, homes that have a low um, or low quality connection. Janice Gates is the director of the Equitable Internet Initiative, a partnership with three community organizations in Detroit and Detroit Community Technology Project. We believe that communication is a fundamental human right. They all work together to get Detroit online, all with funding from foundations and individuals. It's been an issue, a known issue for a long time, you know, whether you're looking at the schools or um, access to gainful employment. The COVID pandemic has shown a really bright light back on the digital divide. While more players have come in to address the problem recently, including several fundraising efforts, EII continues doing its work in Detroit's most underserved neighborhoods. The digital divide is much more than a technology issue. It's much more than a policy issue. Um, I, it really is people at the core. I think there's a lot more work to do. In a way, it's pushing us to be more creative about how we address this problem. If I want something, it's going to be the parents to push it. They got to get together and push it. I'm Chloe Nordquist, reporting. Masonry workers help shape our world. The demand for journeyman bricklayers is at a. Sorry. Um, so yeah, that was our, it was a kind of a mix of our Southwest Detroit team and our North End teams. Um, and it kind of chronicles um, the work that they did last year, which I will tell you all about um, in a bit. But um, first I just wanna start by kind of just sharing some, a little bit of history um, of why the Detroit Community Technology Project and EII um, exist. Um, so back in 2012, um, our fiscal sponsor, Allied Media Projects, um, partnered with the Open Technology Institute in New York to create the Digital Stewards Program. Um, and that really trained um, residents um, that were committed to the Detroit Digital Justice Principles, um, which focused on access, participation, um, common ownership, and healthy communities. Um, and then they trained them in deploying community Mesh, community wireless mesh networks. Um, and it was the stewards program that actually led to the formation of the Detroit Community Technology Project, um, which focuses on community technology, um, which is a way of using and developing technology in a way that helps to sort of heal and restore um, relationships within the neighborhood. Um, and since then, we've implemented the Digital Stewards Program in 10 Detroit neighborhoods and in 11 um, international community neighborhoods. Um, we launched EII in 2016 um, as a way to expand on the Digital Stewards Program. Um, we wanted to incorporate community organizing into their training. Um, and we also wanted to connect a larger number of homes and businesses um, more efficiently. Um, so before I jump into kind of the work, um, I want to share our why. Um, so our why, you know, Detroit has a history um, of digital redlining, um, which, you know, goes all the way back to the 1930s, um, where certain banks and other businesses tried to keep Black people from moving into um, certain neighborhoods. Um, there's also a history here of disinvestment in infrastructure. Um, in addition to that, you know, slow speeds, poor quality service, and, you know, very few um, affordable internet choices exist outside of downtown and midtown Detroit. 
um, which are two neighborhoods here that I've seen a lot of investment from the city and other private companies. Um, and up until, you know, about 2019, um, Detroit was consistently at the list of the nation's top worst connected um, cities, according to the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Um, since then, it has dropped to number 13, um, which, you know, we attribute to the work of organizations um, like ours. So I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. Um, I will say the first couple of slides are charts, but it's not all charts, I promise. I wouldn't do that. Um, they're mostly pictures. Um, but yeah, so I wanted to just share a snapshot um, of the neighborhoods that we work in. So we work in three Detroit neighborhoods, um, Anne Highland Park, which is a city within the city of Detroit. Um, this first neighborhood is the Island View neighborhood. Um, so the city doesn't keep internet access by um, neighborhood here. They keep it according to zip code. So if you want to pull down um, information by neighborhood, you have to go to the census and look up all of the zip codes um, that make up that neighborhood, which makes it really, really difficult to get, you know, super accurate um, data. Um, but this is the Island View neighborhood. <clears throat> um, and you can see here, um, there's more than 60% of residents in this neighborhood with no broadband subscription, which means 40% lack internet access. Um, you can also see that more than 40% of the residents in this neighborhood make less than 25,000 um, a year. Um, and just to give you some context, um, the pre-COVID median income in Detroit was about 31,000. This is the Southwest neighborhood. Um, pretty similar picture to Island View. Um, more than 40% of people here living in poverty, um, large areas where people have no access to internet. Um, and this community um, is different than the others because it has a very large Spanish speaking population. Um, it's also home to 48217. Um, which is considered one of the most polluted zip codes in the country. Um, that zip code is home to um, quite a few refineries in Southwest Detroit. And then this last one is the North End. Um, <clears throat> so again, a very similar picture, large percentages of residents that are unemployed, um, battling poverty um, and with no internet access. Um, so the point of sharing these charts with you is so that you can see how intertwined um, race, unemployment, poverty, and internet access is. Um, and Detroit, which is the majority black city, um, is at the center um, of the intersection of these things. Um, so, you know, for these reasons, we don't think that you can look at digital justice um, without looking at these factors. Um, and, you know, this data makes it clear that internet access is um, a racial justice issue. So what we do, so EII, so we essentially train Detroit residents um, to build and maintain internet infrastructure um, that fosters accessibility, um, consent, safety, and resilience. Um, this program is rooted in the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition principles. Um, that again, focus on access, participation, um, common ownership and healthy communities. Um, we also created the Equitable Internet Initiative Working Principles. Um, and these principles really guide how we work um, and who we work with. Um, I won't go through all of them, but they are available on our website if you want to take a deeper look. Um, but they do focus on storytelling, education, organizing, um, community ownership, governance, authentic relationships, alternative energy, um, and digital security, privacy, and consent. Um, a couple of our network priorities, um, we prioritize homes with no or low connections, um, homes with seniors, um, youth, uh, members that are participating in a government assistance program, um, and then 
um, homes that are located in vulnerable areas, um, which are, could be communities that are, you know, prone to water shutoffs, um, flooding, or black or brownouts. And so we consider EII to be a very decentralized approach to um, connecting communities. Um, this approach is rooted in racial equity. Um, DCTP is a Black woman-led organization. Um, we work in Black and Brown communities. Um, the Digital Stewards, um, who I will share more about in a bit, um, are people of color. Um, and we ensure um, that through our programs and events, meetings, whatever we're having, that those that are the most impacted are the ones at the table. Um, EII is also a partnership um, between DCTP and our three community anchor organizations. Um, so Grace in Action in Southwest Detroit, um, Church of the Messiah in Island View, um, and then the North End Woodward Community Coalition that operates in the North End um, and Highland Park. Um, another part of our approach is um, the training. Um, training is a huge component um, of what we do. Um, our primary role here is in developing um, and training a skilled workforce of digital stewards. Um, and again, I'll talk a bit more about the stewards later because they are a really, really critical point um, of this program. Um, other components of our approach includes a resiliency strategy, um, you know, working with partners that align with our principles and our values, um, honoring net neutrality, digital security, privacy, um, and consent and all of our practices um, and agreements. So a little bit about our anchor orgs. Um, so we started EII in 2016. Um, the pilot actually kicked off in 2017. And that's where we trained 45 digital stewards in community organizing um, and digital engineering skills. Um, they went through a 20 week program, spent the first 10 weeks on community organizing um, alone. Um, once the class was complete, we hired five stewards in each neighborhood for a total of 15. Um, and then they connected 50 homes in each neighborhood that were part of the pilot in 2017. Um, since then, we've connected more than 250 homes um, across the three neighborhoods and in Highland Park. This is Church of the Messiah. Um, this church has a congregation that is about 60% Black male. Um, they also operate Boulevard Harambe, um, which is a nonprofit um, that helps to foster life skills and resources um, for holistic development of young people um, in the neighborhood. Um, this team of digital stewards primarily connects um, affordable housing units. Um, they have this neighborhood, Island View, has the largest population of senior citizens in Detroit. Um, for the techies, they have a fixed wireless gigabit network um, that connects low mixed income apartment buildings and businesses. Um, they also have a makerspace in their basement, which is where they incubate um, small businesses until they can um, obtain their own brick and mortar. And then this is the team at Southwest Detroit, um, which our partners are Grace in Action. Um, and they really run a network of youth run and worker owned collectives. Um, they maintain our only women, all women identified team of digital stewards. Um, this was the most difficult um, neighborhood to get connected because this neighborhood has you know, low rooftops um, and tall trees, which is important when you're thinking of line of sight, which is important for what we do um, because we use point-to-point -point, um, technology. Um, and I'll share a little bit, a little bit about the tech um, later. Um, and then our last anchor org is the North and Woodward Community Coalition. Um, and they originally started off as a transit justice organization. Um, this is actually a hybrid network um, that has both fixed, wire ne 
fixed wireless, so the point-to-point -point technology, um, as well as the mesh. Um, and this network expands from the north end into um, Highland Park. Um, so we initially chose these three organizations to work with um, because they already had an existing relationship with us. Um, our values aligned. Um, each of them had an existing youth program and existing digital literacy programming. And then the stewards are really, um, none of this um, would be possible without the digital stewards. Um, and they really do more than just build out the network infrastructure. Um, they're people of color. They live in the neighborhoods that they work in. Um, they're neighborhood leaders, they're artists, they're teachers, they're organizers, educators, um, media makers. Um, in addition to building out infrastructure, they host um, community meetings, trainings, um, workshops, um, events. Um, like I said, we trained 45 in 2016. Um, we actually just completed training of our second largest cohort. Um, and we trained 20 um, more additional digital stewards um, that will be filling in gaps across the current three networks. Um, one of our stewards um, up until last year participated um, in an apprenticeship program with our partners at 123Net. Um, and 123Net is a commercial ISP provider. Um, they provide our gigabit connections, um, which is how all of the networks are connected. Um, and so we've you know, developed a really beautiful partnership with 123Net. Um, they actually approached us um, after seeing um, a vice video that kind of documented our work, um, said they loved what we were doing and actually donated six connections to us, six gigabit connections. Um, so we were able to get out of our contract with um, a provider that was located in downtown Detroit um, and able to end that relationship amicably. Um, yeah, I have a really great um, working relationship with 123Net. Um, and in the said this before, but in the Southwest Network, um, we actually just won a grant um, through US Ignite um, that's underwritten by the National Science Foundation um, to lay fiber in Southwest, um, which is huge because um, a lot of the cor more corporate ISPs um, have been getting a lot of flack about not investing in and upgrading infrastructure in neighborhoods that are considered um, low income. Um, so we're really excited to be, you know, bringing fiber um, to Southwest Detroit. Um, and we're going to do that with the help um, of our partners at 123Net. Um, the next and then, so like I said, it's no, you know, surprise that the internet became really essential um, when the pandemic first started. Um, you know, particularly as it relates to health information, job information, and learning resources. Um, Pre-pandemic, about 40% of Detroit residents had no internet access, um, and 70% of all students who attended Detroit public schools had no internet access um, at home. So when the pandemic, you know, first kicked off, Detroit was really caught off guard um, by being unprepared and by not investing in um, infrastructure upgrades are working to get residents internet. Um, so the transition to remote work and school was really difficult here. Um, and last year, you know, our stewards became essential workers. Um, when the pandemic first kicked off, um, these two stewards that you see on the screen, one's a network manager, um, they actually canvassed their neighborhood on foot um, you know, as safely as they could, but they, you know, went door to door asking the residents what they needed when the pandemic first began. Um, and then, so yeah, these are just pictures of um, some of the work that they did during the pandemic. Um, so this team in Southwest actually put up six hotspots, um, giving access to uh, um, nearly 800 um, residents that are able to access these hotspots um, in Southwest Detroit. 
um, the team in the North End created something called Internet in a Box, um, which is where all the equipment is put into a box and it's given to the resident. Um, the digital steward talks the resident through the indoor installation process and then they install um, the outdoor equipment. Um, so that's the solution that the North End team came up with um, to do safe installs. Okay, so here's some tech for the techies. Um, so our three anchor orgs receive um, a connection from 123Net, equipment that's on top of the Renaissance Center in downtown Detroit. And the Renaissance Center is the largest building, um, the tallest building in the city. Um, from there, it is redistributed um, to our distribution networks, which are surrounding um, the anchor organizations. Um, and that moves point to point across the neighborhoods. And it's set up by our chief network engineer um, along with the stewards. And then from there and the distribution networks, the stewards connect um, the residential homes and businesses. Um, they put um, CPEs or customer premise equipment um, in each home. Um, and these are the devices that pull the signal from the distribution network um, into the residents' homes. Um, you generally get um, 25 megabits per second up um, and down. Um, we use ubiquity equipment um, and our stewards um, when possible are trained annually um, in ubiquity products. Um, yeah, and we also, I always get asked so much about like how the tech part of this um, works, but trust me when I tell you like, the admin and the organizing and the relationship building um, are the three most critical uh, components of this work. And they definitely take the most time. Um, we're in the fifth year um, of this project um, and those relationships that we developed early on are critically um, important. And then this is just a snapshot of the Southwest network. Um, it's a bit about um, how it looks. You see the yellow kind of dot in the center is where Grace in Action is. Um, the red dots that look like they have apartment buildings in them, those are called the relay sites. <clears throat> and it's from there that the larger, um, the larger red spots, are, that's the distribution network and that's where all of the homes are. So another part of our approach is the resiliency network. Um, and this really, you know, supports the neighborhoods in being self-determined, safe and resilient, um, specifically during an emergency or um, a disaster. And resilience, um, a DCTP for us, it means, you know, building and deepening the relationships that we have so that if an emergency or disaster does happen, we have those relationships to tap into. Um, so ours includes a battery backup system, and this will really keep the network backbone up and running um, during a power outage. Um, we launched an intranet last year. Um, you know, maybe a couple months after the pandemic. Um, and the intranet is a way for residents to communicate with each other offline um, and without an internet signal. Um, so it's a great way for them to be sharing information um, or for the anchor organizations to post information about health, transportation, food, um, education packets. Um, we also installed five solar, five Wi-Fi enabled solar charging stations across um, the three networks. Um, so people can, you know, access the intranet um, from the hotspots located there um, or charge their mobile device. Um, this year, we're kind of looking to do the full implementation of the resiliency strategy. Um, the last step in that for us is to work with um, each of the anchor organizations um, to develop a preparedness plan. And that preparedness 
plan is something that will be used. Um, so, you know, should we have another pandemic, an emergency or a disaster, the community will all have access to that preparedness plan. Um, so that if anything happens, they can deploy this entire um, resiliency strategy. And then the final component of that is the portable network kit. Um, picture of that. Yes. The portable network kit, um, it was designed by our partners in New York, um, Community Technology New York. Um, and its purpose is to extend um, the Wi Fi signal an additional three blocks. Um, so it can create essentially its own kind of autonomous communications system um, if there is an internet connection. Um, if there is no internet connection, then it can act as a hotspot. And then finally, um, you know, I just want to share that, you know, what's happening in Detroit, um, which, you know, I mentioned is a majority Black city, is a great example of what can happen when, you know, ISPs don't practice net neutrality, um, when they aren't regulated, and when they're allowed to operate solely um, to produce a profit. Um, over the last two years, Detroit has basically become ground zero in piloting mass surveillance technology. Um, some examples of this, um, you know, a deployment of facial recognition technology here um, and Comcast partnership with the city of Detroit on something called Project Greenlight. Um, and this is actually a real-time surveillance program um, that sends live feeds from businesses that pay into this program it sends a live feed um, directly to the Detroit Police Department's real-time crime center. Um, and then, you know, ISPs like AT&T and Comcast, since they aren't required to update, you know, the outdated infrastructure, um, you know, much of which exists in black and brown communities, um, those residents are then subject to slower speeds, poorer quality um, connections. Um, to combat um, the school issue, um, because 70% pre-pandemic didn't have access, um, the Detroit Public Schools worked with um, a number of foundations and private companies here to launch something called Connected Futures. Um, and through that, they gave the 51,000 Detroit Public School students um, either a tablet or a laptop that was Wi-Fi enabled. Um, originally, it was for six months, um, but I've heard that they've extended it to, I think, the entire school year. Um, but there still has not been, you know, a sustainable or long-term solution to um, getting those 51,000 students access at home without that tablet. Um, you know, even with, um, I think a few weeks ago, Comcast announced um, there was delaying data caps um, in the Northeast. Um, Michigan is um, one of, I think, the 27 states where they still do have data caps. Um, and these have been in place here since 2016. Um, and it's really allowed them to, you know, generate profit um, from residents in Detroit that for some have to choose between paying a utility bill or paying for unaffordable um, internet access. Um, share. So yeah, so we, you know, we at EII, we really kind of see ourselves as the alternative to big tech, um, you know, because our networks are community-based, they're community-governed, um, and because of the relationships that we hold. Um, you know, we practice net neutrality, we state these in our, you know, client service agreements. Um, we actually have the digital stewards verbally review the privacy policy um, with every person that comes on to um, the network. Um, and we explain, you know, in detail what information, what data we are collecting from people um, and why. Uh, but we don't collect, um, we don't collect information around number of people living in your household or um, income, you know, information. We don't collect information like that. Uh, and then finally, I think, um, you know, what is next for us? Um, 
So we're launching the fiber pilot in Southwest Detroit, which is going to keep us really, really busy. Um, we are looking to expand um, to the west side of Detroit, which is an area that we are not in yet. So we're in talks with um, a potential anchor organization um, on the you know, west side. Um, we're part of a community technology collective um, with our partners in New York called Community Technology New York. Um, and they are actually supporting network build outs in Kingston, New York um, and Los Angeles. Um, and we are building an online learning platform. And this platform will allow us to basically take the digital stewards curriculum and put it online. Um, so that will allow us to not only train locally, um, but nationally and internationally. And that is EII in a nutshell. Thank you, that, that's super interesting. Uh, that's, so, um, uh, well, so I, I have a couple of questions and then, uh, then we'll open it up to uh, other folks if they have questions. <clears throat> so in the, the early on, you, you had a slide where you were talking about the different sort of principles mm -hmm. um, and uh, you mentioned sort of authentic relationships. I was wondering if you could sort of explain what you mean by that. Yeah, so what I mean by authentic um, relationships is, <clears throat> so the relationship is not transactional. So you won't just see a digital steward, you know, come into your home, say I hooked up your equipment, tell you if you have any questions, you know, call the customer support number, go online. Um, because our stewards work in the, and live in the neighborhoods, um, they often come with their own personal relationships. Um, but they also know the neighborhood and they know um, the people. So the relationship isn't kind of a one-off. Um, it's not just that we're, you know, bringing internet access to you. It's also that we're going to show you how to use it. Um, and then we're also going to have, you know, different events and trainings and workshops throughout the year um, to support you, um, you know, with that as well. So authentic relationships is kind of a way of describing the kind of community facing kind of dynamics, the way that you, that the digital stewards and the anchor organizations kind of engage with uh, local community members. Yes, and it's, yeah, and we, you know, we always say building with, um, because we also like that same resident, like we want your voice at the table. Um, so for example, the intranet, we included all of the residents and anchor organizations in that process. Um, so the anchor orgs distributed um, a survey to people currently on the network, people looking to be on the network um, to get their thoughts about what they thought should be on that intranet. Because um, we never want to be, you know, the organization coming into the neighborhood telling you what you need. Um, we want you to tell us what you need. Um, and work together to build that. So, so speaking of the internet, the, the intranet um, that you've set up, is that citywide or is that specific to the neighborhoods? Yeah, it's specific to the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Is your ambition to sort of extend between, to connect them, to connect the different neighborhoods together? We have, so that hasn't come up yet. Um, and only because like with the three neighborhoods that we're working in right now, they're so incredibly different. Um, so like the Southwest neighborhood, everything has to be translated. Um, but yeah, it's just because of the nuance and just the, even the dynamics within the neighborhood. Um, you know, right now it is neighborhood by neighborhood, but I could see in the future creating something that was citywide, um, but that didn't have, you know, neighborhood specific um, information on there. Um, so, sort of going back to this question of uh, authentic relationships, does, how does that relate to your sort of like the upstream sort of relationships, if you will, your you talked about shifting uh, the ISP that you use to one, two, three net. So were you were you uh, connected to Rocket Fiber before that in downtown? 
Is that who you were yeah. working with? And, and so can you talk a little bit about the differences between those two and why you made that change? Yeah, so, you know, Rocket Fiber is owned by um, Dan Gilbert, um, you know, big billionaire, um, doing a lot of building and investing in, you know, downtown Detroit, um, even has, you know, they even have their own kind of surveillance system um, down there. And so when the contract with Rocket Fiber was, you know, set up, it wasn't, it was something that we, you know, had to ask ourselves about if that was, if that really aligned with our principles. Um, and to think, you know, how do we go about explaining that um, to our stakeholders that, you know, we're getting this connection from a company and organization that this person you know, owns and he, you know, within some circles in the city, he doesn't have the best rep. Um, we were paying, I think, $650 a month for each of the three connections. Um, and the relationship was, it was friendly, but it was transactional. Um, like we didn't have discussions about, you know, Rocket Fiber employees coming in to train digital stewards, for example, because we already kind of knew our principles and values don't really align that way. Um, when one, two, three net approached us, um, they wanted to actually, um, I mean, they actually mentioned community. Um, they wanted to work with us to build um, and they had like a long-term kind of sustainability um, plan which kind of meshed with where we were coming from. Um, we wanted to build with, not for, um, the community. And so it's been a really, um, we have many, many conversations with, um, you know, one, two, three, net. and it's in, it's an exchange, right? So we're not paying for a service yet, um, but it's, right now it's just an exchange. They're giving us the connections. They're also giving, you know, consultation to our digital stewards. Um, even, you know, that mentorship to our chief network um, engineer, um, even, you know, serving as a tech consultant of sorts to DCTP and kind of all of that relationship over the past, I want to say three years, led us to this fiber pilot um, and putting them on that grant proposal. Um, and then us about to move through this really intense year long um, engagement with them. That's that's really interesting. Um, I, uh, I and sort of my last question is uh, kind of a double question, I guess. Which is, I mean, do do you see the work that you're doing as a model that should um, that should be rep that that could replicate elsewhere, or that should inform sort of national policies? Um, and I guess along those lines. To what extent does the kind of digital divide as an issue sort of oversimplify poverty as a sort of complex kind of social problem? You know, uh, in you know, the, so that's a bit loaded. I, I I know, but you know, I just yeah. Yeah. Um. So yeah, the first question, we definitely want it to be um, replicated. Um. We you know believe fundamentally in community governance. Um, kind of gotten away from saying community ownership, um, more to governance, which is, I think, more of an inclusive um, term. But yeah, we definitely want this to be replicated. That's in part why the platform is being developed um, and why we're starting with the digital stewards, um, because we really want people to know that we really want people to grasp the concept of community technology. Um, so we're not just training technologists to go out there and do a tech thing. Um, we're training them to also be responsible um, in how they go into and move through, um, you know, the neighborhoods. Um, now, do, making it replicable on a large scale, like, is pretty much a capacity issue right now, right? So we get organizations every single day um, that kind of come in, kind of email us, call us, um, wanting to replicate this project. But we're like a team of five 
internally um, and then there's the anchor orgs and so it's really hard to kind of you know be able to help this group here and this group and this group and this group um, but we are in the process of building our staff um, and that is a priority um, so I'm looking to do like a really large training um, probably summer early fall um, for the organizations you know that have reached out that really want to replicate this um, in that, um, in there, I'll kind of move through the more detailed um, version of our, of how we decentralize. Because, um, you know, there's like, there's roles, even with, um, at the anchor organizations, like each of them has a project manager, a network manager, and a team of digital stewards. Um, and it's, you know, it's not easy to get, it's not easy to get that, get there. Um, you know, we're in year five and, you know, love our anchor ors, but have, you know, having, you know, intense, hard, but necessary discussions with each other about how we sustain um, and expand this work. Um, can you just repeat your second question one more time for me? Um, yeah, so the, the second question was just the extent to which, like, the, the idea of the digital divide and sort of internet connectivity sort of oversimplifies um, uh, sort of the issue of poverty, right? Like that somehow if we get everybody connected that that somehow will solve sort of poverty as, a, as an issue. Um, I mean, I think um, I would sort of, you know, I think obviously internet connectivity and sort of the questions of um, workforce development, you know, play a, a kind of key role um, I guess my, uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's just trying to understand how these initiatives fit within a broader kind of scheme to kind of help empower and, and just uh, provide communities with the resources that they need, right? I guess the, the issue that I, I'm coming up against with it, you're, that I'm thinking about is, is this, you know, the work that you guys are doing is, is, is very impressive. Um, it's just, uh, uh, you know, I could see it, and and I and I would just like to see resources directed towards um, efforts like this, and um, and directed towards communities uh, that you know that are dealing with long term sort of poverty, um, you know, rather than seeing it as an example of like kind of bootstrapping where you know communities can just pull themselves up out of poverty without external resources, if that makes sense. I, I don't know. I'm just curious what your thoughts on, on that are. Yeah, yeah I think um, for me here um, in Detroit, um, we've seen that kind of, instead of the like expectation being there of kind of pull yourself up, it's the let me ride in and save you. Let me ride in and save you from yourself. Um, and here are all the solutions I'm going to offer you. I don't even know if you need them because I didn't ask you what you needed. Um, I'm just here to offer them to you. And I'm also just going to throw um, money at it. So like last year when the pandemic, you know, first started, Detroit was in the news a lot specifically about um, the schools and the number of kids here who didn't have um, devices and had no internet access. Um, at home. Um, and because of that, they started this initiative called Connect Human 3, um, which is an initiative between the city of Detroit, a number of foundations here, um, some public and private um, companies, one of which is um, Rocket Mortgage, who's part of the Quicken family, who's part of the Dan Gilbert. Um, he owns them. And, Essentially, they invested $23 million into something that was totally untested, um, it was brand new. It was primarily made up of people who kind of played here, so didn't really live or work in the city, um, right? They just wanted to kind of throw, you know, money um, at this problem. Um, so making assumptions that, um, you know, if we just put people up to the internet, they should be able to get everything they need. And, you know, these problems, you know, won't exist. Well, they will still exist if you're giving them crappy equipment um, that's constantly shutting down, 
and they're constantly having to miss time from you know remote school that's already um, difficult enough if you're a senior and they give you internet access. Um, I've heard from a number of organizations that have reached out to us that yes, they've gotten devices for their seniors, but no one has shown the seniors how to use the devices. Um, so for me, it's kind of a, I don't know, it's, it, to me, it feels like sabotage. Um, so I'm gonna give you this thing because it looks good to give it to you, um, but I'm gonna take shortcuts on how, showing you how to use it because I don't really want you to know how to use it. Because um, also here, like I mentioned, is the surveillance piece. So if our stewards and you know organizations like ours continue to train people in digital security, privacy, and consent, they're going to get louder um, about the red flags involved in mass surveillance, um, which like I said, is a really big thing here. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry, it was a long way of saying, <laughs> I think the answer to your question is, in Detroit, it's, I think it's mostly, let me write in and save you, um, which you know goes all the way back to pre-bankruptcy days here. So uh, bankruptcy, yeah. So this is like one of the few references I've heard to the city, to the municipality. I assume that's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, so you've mentioned Dan Gilbert and the sort of, um, it's like foundations and big and private enterprise, but is there a role for the city and the government to play? Oh, my daughter's just come in. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there is a role. I think, um, you know, in part making the process easier for organizations like ours, um, especially as they might look at organizations like ours as competition to the larger ISPs, which, you know, come with power and come with money to invest into other things. So they're, you know, they can come in and incentivize city officials to kind of support them, um, which has happened, um, you know, which has happened um, here. Um, we're we're still trying to figure out how we play with Connect 313. Um, so, you know, we're part of the Community Advisory Council. Um, we attend the monthly meetings. Um, you know, I just, yeah, I think the city could make it. Um, I think they could assist with um, the way that ISPs and people come into the neighborhood, you know, so just like basically being more of an advocate for the resident versus the private organization, um, which I unfortunately haven't seen, you know, in Detroit or a lot of other cities like Cleveland has a very similar situation to us, um, Chicago as well. Well, I mean, I think in terms of this idea of what you guys are doing as a, as a model that can be replicated, it seems like it would be, it could really complement, be complementary to municipal networks, uh, initiatives, you know, on the part that, you know, uh, city and regional governments might, you know, uh, adopt, uh, you know, or at least, or at least fund mm -hmm. in, uh, efforts that are a little bit more community oriented. Um, well, at this point, I want to uh, give uh, some of the other folks opportunities to ask questions. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, uh, let's see, un I'm going to allow folks to unmute themselves. Uh, so if anyone has a question, you can unmute yourself and ask it. Um, yeah, um, thanks, Janice, for the talk. Um, I, a few questions. Um, start with this one i wanted to know the biggest changes you've seen so far in the neighborhoods um you've connected i thought it was cool like in the video you started with hearing that woman talk about how all the kids would gather kind of by that mesh network to do their homework and kind of how that has created a safe space for them um so if you want to share like one or two things about that oh, i think you're muted janice Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think since the project has started, you know, kind of the biggest change I've seen um, is in, 
I want to say, I guess, trust from the residents. You know, when we first started, the stewards were literally going door to door. At that time, we thought it would be all free. Um, they were telling people it was free and it's coming and, hey, you want to sign up. But even with the relationships the stewards had, you know, people were leery and they were um, skeptical. Um, now, you know, five years later, we hear stories from the stewards about, you know, them getting calls on their cell phones from residents like, hey, you know, this thing happened. Can you look into this? Um, so the more personal, you know, interactions are happening that, you know, would, I mean, AT&T was just here at, at my apartment Saturday and I can't even imagine calling one of the tech guys on my cell phone um, for anything. Um, so yeah, I would say trust. Um, trust is a huge, huge thing, which is why we, you know, stick so hard to those principles because the residents, um, you know, have, you know, the residents have taken to them and they hold us accountable and they hold the anchor orders accountable to that as well. And so we have to hold ourselves accountable to that to keep up um, this community trust. And Norma, that you saw in the video, her, um, I just looked at the usage numbers the other day and she had last month um, in March, there was more than 1200 um, unique users. Um, in her equipment so and she's like right on a block she's at the end of a block in the north end which is amazing um kind of going off that theme of trust you talked a little bit about project green light um and the mass surveillance um i wanted to know like what was it like um getting i don't know if consent like was involved with that or like because you talked about consent as one of your, um, the foundations of your organization. Um, like what was the feeling of, and I don't completely understand like um, Project Greenlight, um, but like, what was it like talking to residents, people of the neighborhoods, like about it, what were their feelings? Like, has that changed at all? Um, and like, is it, it's different from the surveillance system that you were talking about with Dan Gilbert. Um, also mm -hmm. like, also being um, broadcasted to police. Like how did people feel about that? But obviously it was for um, business owners. So it's kind of a, just two sides of it. Yeah, it's, um, so yeah, business owners, like gas stations, liquor stores, um, even churches community centers, um, they've really expanded it. Um, there was some discussion about ex expanding it to the schools. Um, you know, my former colleague, um, Tawana Petty, um, she used to lead the data justice program at DCTP. Um, and so she, you know, I'd be doing EII and she'd be out, you know, her focus was primarily Project Greenlight, um, specifically educating um, the public about the red flags that we saw in there. Um, she wrote um, a report around it. I can be sure to share that with Dustin, um, to share that um, with all of you. But it was really difficult. Um, we initially started off attending, you know, members of the team, these board of police commissioner meetings, um, which is supposed to be a civilian oversight board of the Detroit Police Department. Um, and a lot of the, it was an uphill battle. A lot of the residents um, didn't see any issue with, you know, a Project Greenlight um, or facial recognition um, until, you know, Tawana attended many, 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 many meetings, um, produced a lot of material. Um, and it took her a couple years actually to start getting to the point where residents would start to answer, start to ask their own questions at the Board of Police Commissioner meetings. Um, so we look at success kind of in that realm of those meetings went from being lightly attended to um, with the work that she was doing and we were doing to heavily attended um, and more people were making public comments um, about Project Greenlight, um, about facial recognition. Um, there was even two men here that were falsely accused because of facial recognition um, software, which 
um, falsely identify as specifically um, black and brown people. Um, I hope that answered your question. I think I forgot the maybe the last part. No, it's okay. <laughs> but you guys, you're not involved with Project Greenlight. Project Greenlight is something that was already going on um, involved with the police department, right? Yes, yeah. So yeah, we're not involved with Project Greenlight um, or official rec at all. Um, none of Got our, it. yeah, none of our equipment, um, even if it's on a business, is allowed to be used. Um, for yeah, I had thought you said that you guys um, were heading Project Greenlight, and I was kind of surprised at that. Um, oh yeah, no, 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 no. I mean, we've been asked. <laughs> We've definitely been asked, but yeah, none of our equipment um, can be used for surveillance. So. Um, I don't know if anybody else has questions. I have one more, but I'll wait a second. Um, I have a question and a comment. Um, okay, uh, first, thank you so much. Um, I just want to say this is the first lecture series that like, I've attended that has someone that looks like me and that's super cool. Um, and going to your topics about trust and sustainability, um, when your oh, oh, sorry. Um, when your project started, like five, or like when the oh, wait, wait, when your project first started, um, I guess my question is like, how, did you imagine your own vision like it would expand to be this big, and how like how did you? Like how did you keep like how sorry <laughs> how did you how like what skills and like what tools did you use to make it like to make it sustainable and to make it like a trusted um, resource within your community like even when you were partnering with like companies that maybe like didn't really have the same beliefs that you that you had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, thank you for that. Yeah, we, um, it's been a lot over five years, it's been a lot. Um, Cause I came in kind of right at the, I came in, they brought me in to launch EII. Um, so I've been here since the beginning, been able to, you know, see it grow. Um, and I think that's one of the tools is longevity, um, especially from the DCTP staff, because we're, you know, our, role is to provide the anchor organizations with IT support, um, program management, um, staffing support, um, IT support. Um, and you know, myself and the chief network engineer who's been around since 2012, um, I think that is a big um, piece of it. Um, you know, he and I, I spend kind of the most time with the managers, the network managers, um, and the project managers kind of thinking through sustainability. Um, and we honestly have not answered that question yet. Um, right now, honestly, we're at the point of defining what sustainability looks and feels like um, for us. Um, you know, instead of we, we worked with um, an accountant a couple years ago to help us develop feasibility studies. Um, which took into account like you need this many stewards, they need to work this many hours, you have this gigabit connection that can hold a total of 700 homes, this is how many homes you, and businesses you need to connect, this is what you need to charge to get to this profit for this year and by the end of I think it was five years, this is when you're going to be profitable. Um, literally within months, we well, what 2020 happened because those were completed in 2019 2020 happened and all of that was blown out of the water because you can't you know you can't plan for that um two of the organizations even stopped charging people um, so they weren't even bringing in revenue um that way and we only charge for a resident anywhere from free to 20 dollars a month um businesses pay anywhere from 50 to 70 dollars a month um, so those feasibility studies we saw were way too aggressive. Um, we also saw that it will be another few years before these networks, if they ever are, are profit generating. Um, because it could look like that, you know, isn't the sustainability piece 
um, for us. And that's kind of where we're coming out of now. Um, it's moving from, oh, we thought this would be able to generate a profit for each org in five years, but that's clearly not going to happen. And this work isn't possible right now without um, grant money or foundation money. Um, the fiber pilot that I mentioned that we got through US Ignite, that's for 300,000. Um, it cost about 30,000 a mile to lay fiber. Um, and Southwest Detroit's huge. Um, the other neighborhoods are huge. Um, Southwest actually has the most proximity to the fiber lines in the city. Um, but it's, you know, currently the technology is ubiquity and it's point to point. Um, which is a lot cheaper than fiber. Even with this fiber pilot money, we're still gonna have to raise additional funds because um, <clears throat> you know we haven't done fiber before and we don't know what we don't know yet. Um, and we don't know how expensive what we don't know is. Um, so yeah, I mean, sustainability is an ongoing question that we literally talk about bi-weekly. Um. <laughs> Um, I have a follow-up question, and I'm trying to be able to word this in a better way. Um, on a more personal note, when you're like organizing, working for like, like, and like working on a project that um, is somewhat personal in a sense, like where you seem to, to make sure you live in the neighborhood, um, how do you balance your like personal like wants? and like your dreams and what you want for this project versus like what's feasible for you and for the company and like not get burnt out. Cause I've noticed that's something that I personally have a lot of trouble with. Yeah, that's real, thank you. <laughs> yes, well, they call me the boundary queen at work um, because you know, because of those authentic relationships, you know, um, in addition to the, you know, we meet with the stewards biweekly, we meet with the project managers biweekly. Um, but we're also, you know, even before we were working from home, we were using, you know, our cell phones to communicate with each other. Um, and the project managers call me all the time. Um, and they're, the, you know, they really are in charge of making sure the program is implemented in their neighborhood. They call all the time. And, you know, I try to tell people, you know, I'm trying to work from 10 to 6. Um, but I was getting calls at 9 o'clock in the morning, 9 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night. I was getting weekend text messages. Um, and with a project like what we're doing, um, because you want to be building with the community and each other, the lines of communication are open. And so you need to put those boundaries um, need to put those boundaries um, in place. And honestly, I have friends that, um, you know, are constantly in, you know, day long Zoom meetings as well, um, social justice organizers and just kind of watching um, them and how they handle, um, well, seeing how often, you know, they're called on, that's made me get more serious about, you know, the boundaries that I have in place. So after six o'clock, you can text me, but you probably won't get a response. Um, that's when the biggest thing for me is the boundaries around my time. And, you know, asking for what you need. Like if you need, if it's something where they can get you another volunteer person, ask for what you need. Like we had to have a very real conversation of like, we can't sustain this work on a lean team of five. Like we're all doing amazing work um, above and beyond, but you know, when the need for people is real, um, you gotta find money for it. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Um, one last one. Uh, it sounds to me like you're more like you're doing more work with people and um, community organizing rather than tech. I might be wrong, but um, obviously you're involved with it in some way with the D, uh, DCTP and uh, EII. Um, 
big issue in tech is that the leaders of the conversation are often white men. I just wanted to know like what your experience was like getting started or building some of these relationships um, as a woman and black woman um, in tech. Um, sort of a general question, but if you want to speak to that. Yeah, that's a great question. That's been, um, that's been its own wild ride over the past five years. Um, Cause me and my colleague, um, his name's Anderson Walworth. He's our chief network engineer um, and he's a white male. Um, you know, we often attend meetings, you know, together, right? So he's big tech guy. Um, I do attend all of the tech training so that I actually know how to talk about it. Um, but there would be meetings where we, me and him with some partners, um, and I, the first time I think it was with the organization that we originally were working with um, on the solar charging stations. And they you know, had this grand idea of something beyond solar charging stations. And I was like, you know, it's a great idea. It was also just mentioned at this meeting. And I was like, you know, we need to go back and talk about that as a team, you know, we have to factor in, you know, things like capacity. Um, and after the meeting, he followed up with Anderson directly, um, ran the idea by, you know, him again. And, I, you know, I was pretty insulted, really, you know, offended because internally we have a more, we have titles, yep. But we also have a, a really collaborative um, leadership model. Um, and especially kind of the EII team, which um, is essentially myself, him, and our director. Um, we don't make decisions um, in isolation of each other. Um, so we're always, literally always talking to each other, always in meetings, always slacking, always texting. Um, you know, so there have been things when, you know, that has happened. Um, you know, I had a fear that that might happen with one, two, three net, but that has never happened with them. Um, and it's later because I found out that they actually, all of their project managers, last time I heard, it was a few weeks ago, were all women, um, which to me was like amazing that here's this big tech company, a commercial ISP, and you have all women, um, you know, pro project managers. And so, they never excluded me from the conversation. And when, you know, when things like that do happen, um, Anderson's pretty good about like getting us all back, you know, on the thread together and just kind of making it known to the partner that, um, you know, we don't work that way. Um, but, you know, also finding that it's helpful to just keep speaking out about it. Like someone sent me an email the last week um, to attend this event. Um, it was about broadband infrastructure and the money from the American Recovery Act um, through the Biden administration. It was basically a conversation on how these funds should be spent. Um, so I'm looking through the email and I see it's all, it's a whole panel of three white men um, and the moderator is a white man. And I was like, first, you know, I hit my colleagues back and I was like, I'm not attending this because there's no one on that panel that looks like me. There's no women. And we're constantly talking about, we're training a new you know, generation of technologists that don't have to be white male. They can be women and people of color. Um, and it actually bothered me so much, I actually reached out to the moderator. Um, you know, he got back to me. Um, I actually wound up attending the event. Um, he profusely apologized and then some, he must have shared what my email said with the panelists because they also noted that the panel is really white um, and went into, you know, one went into detail about how, you know, internet access is a racial justice issue. Um, so, you know, it's really just kind of exhausting, honestly, having to keep doing that and having to continuously explain to people, you know, women are in tech, black women, are in tech, like here we are, Black women-led technology organization. Um, you know, it happens to our director um, as well, where we're excluded from conversations and it's like, we're only invited in after we've kind of proven, um, after we've proven something to someone else. So yeah, it's exhausting, but you know, we have to keep saying something. Otherwise, I think 
we're complicit if we just keep participating. Thanks for sharing your experience. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah excellent question, Corey. Yeah, uh, any other questions before we wrap things up? Um, yeah, so sorry if you already uh, mentioned this, but with the new presidential administration, are there any promising changes related to net neutrality or not so much? Yeah, I mean, yes, net neutrality is a big thing. Um, I sit on the, the Lifeline Coalition, um, which was primarily working on um, the emergency broadband subsidy. Um, so that was the biggest thing, I think, um, making it, you know, giving up to, I think, $50 for a resident um, to purchase internet access. Um, but that is the next thing that, you know, our team and this coalition is kind of looking to delve into um, is getting net neutrality um, back up, which I think will come when they, I think, confirm a permanent FCC chair. Um, to kind of make this interim, Jessica Rosen were so permanent. Um, yeah, but that's that's really huge for you know us because um, we during the stewards graduation last time is actually when it we got the news that it was repealed. Um, we were having a huge event that day that was a community event um, had rented out this huge space, um, and then to hear the news of net neutrality. Um, literally kind of made all of us want to work harder. It actually inspired everyone in the room. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely something that is at the top of our radar. Um, though we're, we still practice it on our networks, um, you know, just kind of moving into the, how do we educate, you know, the community at large about the importance of net neutrality um, and get them to start talking about it. Because I think when you get the community to start talking about it and they get louder, then people start listening. Yeah, that makes sense, thanks. Well, thank you so much. Um, th this was really uh, fantastic, really great. Um, well, um, with that, uh, I guess we'll we'll say goodbye. Um, th thank you so much, uh, Janice. Yeah, thank you all for having me. You all ask such great questions. I love those questions. <laughs> thank you. It, it looks it looks like you have a have an excellent um, cat structure in the back there uh, behind you. I do. Um, of course, he's yeah. right here on the top of the recliner, bathing himself. Um, He's usually over there playing. Mm. Yeah, I was I was kind of waiting for your cat to show up at some point. Seeing that great structure in the back. All righty, well, um, toodaloo, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you all. all right. It's good to meet you all. Nice to meet you. Also, <laughs> sort of random side note, you gave me a, a better understanding of if you know Danny Brown, uh, he has a song E W N E S W, East Side, East Side, Northwest, Northwest. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But now that I is have. How it is in Detroit. Yeah, there are all those. There's East Side, West Side. That's actually been a big thing here. I'm a native West Sider. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, y'all. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye.